Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, a bonus episode on breaking news, the Omicron variant. I catch up with virologist Dr. Andrew Pekosh of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We'll be talking to Dr. Pekosh periodically as new evidence comes in. Let's listen. Professor Pekosh, thanks so much for joining us on short notice to talk about Omicron. How did Omicron come to the world's attention? So a couple things happened the week of Thanksgiving. Early in the week, some sequences of a of a virus that came to be known as the Omicron variant were passed around and available on some national databases. And they were very concerning on a couple of levels. One is there was a really large amount of mutations in this virus, much more than we would expect from the normal evolution of this virus. And importantly, many of those mutations occurred in the spike protein, the target of the vaccine. And it's the protein that the virus uses to bind and enter cells. And and to summarize quickly, those mutations look like they would allow the virus to escape from vaccine-induced immunity to some degree, allow the virus to bind more tightly to cells, and allow the virus to enter cells faster. So on paper, this sequence of the virus looked very concerning. And then on Thanksgiving Day, South African public health officials realized that one of the tests that they were using to identify COVID-19 cases could be used as a surrogate for identifying people infected with Omicron. And that then indicated that there was a large surge of cases of COVID-19 that's being driven by Omicron in South Africa. And I think that was the final piece of the puzzle that allowed the South African public health officials to really make the announcement that there's a variant of concern circulating. And of course, everybody in the world then got their attention and started to monitor for it. And so the World Health Organization jumped in as well. Absolutely. And again, they're the ones that are making the best distinctions about how to gauge a variant of concern with SARS-CoV-2. They immediately saw all that data and relatively quickly moved this from a relatively unknown variant to a variant of concern, which is their highest category of categorizing SARS-CoV-2 viruses. So it sounds like the mutations alone really cause concern. And then there's some data from the real world showing the virus can spread. Absolutely. That's a really good summary where we are right now. And I guess I'll point out that, you know, we've had variants emerge that had mutations that are concerning. The beta and the gamma variant were ones when they initially emerged, we thought, well, this is a virus that we should really be worried about. None of those ended up spreading globally in a way that we were afraid of, which of course is a good thing. But then we've also had variants like Alpha and Delta, which spread globally with amazing speed. So what we want to figure out is, does Omicron fall into that first category or that second category or perhaps someplace in between? How are we going to figure that out? Everything comes down to good testing, sequencing, and contact tracing. Because what we want to know is, is this virus spreading? Is it spreading in a way that we might suggest that it's driving the total case numbers in a particular country? And because we've seen this virus now appear in a lot of other countries due to travel, we want to start looking for community spread in those other countries, which would again be another sign that this is a particularly transmissible virus and raise our concern about it. Now, obviously, Big question is how much protection the vaccine gives against this new variant. How are we going to answer that question? Well, my lab, for instance, is on the lookout now to try to get virus isolates into the laboratory to do those kind of tests to directly get some data that asks how much immunity induced by vaccination or by infection cross reacts with this variant. There are several laboratories and the vaccine manufacturers that are using other methods 
that are based solely on the sequence that's available to generate what's called pseudoviruses that can allow them to do the same types of experiments. So I really think that transmission is one important thing, but almost equally important is to get data on how well vaccine-induced immunity recognizes Omicron, because that's really going to tell us how susceptible a population is to this particular variant. And can you take me into the lab for a second? If you had those isolates right now, what would be the test you'd be doing to answer that question? So we would do something called a neutralization assay. And in that assay, we take a known amount of virus and we mix it with serum from individuals who are vaccinated or infected. And then we ask, does that serum stop the virus from infecting cells? And that assay takes about 48 hours for us to get a readout. And it reads out a a type of antibody called the neutralizing antibody response, which a lot of studies have suggested are a really good correlate of protection from infection for SARS-CoV-2. So we're now lining up all of our serum banks and waiting for access to a virus isolate, which honestly, we hope we don't have access to a homegrown isolate. But as soon as we have one, we're going to be doing those types of tests to determine how well these neutralizing antibodies recognize Omicron. Now, another question is whether this variant might cause more severe disease. What do we know about that? Very little right now. There seems to be a number of people who have been infected with Omicron who have been vaccinated or previously infected. The reports initially aren't of any hospitalizations, but again, case numbers are very low right now. And that may be just a portion of the population that's being looked at. So we don't know anything about disease severity uh, in any substantive way. I think that's something else that's going to come out as we see the transmission occurring. We'll be able to monitor for disease severity and be able to make some assessments of how severe infection with Omicron is. So a lot of data coming both from the lab and from surveillance in the world. How long before we have a much more detailed picture of the risk posed by Omicron? I think studies of spread in the community will probably know within a week or two weeks how efficiently this virus is spreading in the community. It'll probably be another two to three weeks before we start to see some of the data on how well vaccine immune responses cross-react to Omicron. And then soon after that, there'll just be an avalanche of data. But the critical thing is going to be what happens with Omicron in that intervening time. Can the public health interventions, testing and sequencing and contact tracing limit the spread of this virus before we really can put together a firm plan as to how to counteract it based on its potential risk? Some people are making the analogy back to like March 2020 or February 2020. But in fact, we know a lot about this virus. In the intervening time, we've learned a lot. We have a lot of scientific tools. We're going to get a bunch of answers. And I guess the question I have is, while we're in this period of uncertainty, maybe we could call it concerned uncertainty, what are reasonable steps for governments to take and for people to take? Maybe let's start with governments. See a lot of travel restrictions. How do you put that together? On paper, everybody thinks travel restrictions should work well. In reality, they don't really work as well as people think they do. There are consequences of travel restrictions in terms of people not wanting to get testing, people not talking about their exposure history. So at best, travel restrictions are one part of a larger comprehensive strategy that includes more testing, contact tracing, sequencing of viruses, and understanding people's travel history so you can target those testing and sequencing to individuals that might be at an increased risk of infection with Omicron. So travel restrictions by themselves are less than useful, but you know one can see how in a strategy that includes lots of other things, there are at least one component that could slow the spread of this virus. Do you think that this virus has spread around the world by now? Yeah, I think the data right now is showing that It's present in in a large and growing number of countries. We don't have any data yet about community spread in those countries, and that really is going to be the critical thing. Have countries been able to stop it in terms of the travelers that have moved into those countries, or have those travelers passed it on to individuals in the community? That's going to be the critical thing that we have to address right now. And to be honest, that's the credit that we have to give the, the scientists and the public health officials in South Africa. They bravely came out early 
to talk about this. You know, they're suffering some of the consequences of travel restrictions and other things, but it's because they came out early with this data and told the world about it that we are probably going to be much better prepared to be able to limit Omicron's public health threat at the cost of you know, the South African scientists coming out and saying this early. Well, maybe there should be some appropriate appreciation and compensation for the harms that some of these countries have experienced. Absolutely. And I think you're starting to see some of the issues now of, you know, dozens of countries have Omicron and travel cases, but they haven't progressed to any travel restrictions on those countries. And so it's the equitable use of these things that really is something that isn't talked about enough, I think. So one other global topic that's coming under a lot of scrutiny is the failure of the world to provide vaccines for countries like those that are affected by Omicron in in Southern Africa. Do you think that could have made a difference had the world been more aggressive in vaccinating equitably? Yeah, you know, viruses, viruses mutate all the time, but viruses aren't smart. They don't know where to mutate their genomes to make them better transmissible. It's just a random event. And because it's a random event, if you limit the number of cases, if you limit virus replication, you'll limit the chance that an advantageous mutation accumulates in a virus. And so the faster we get vaccines globally, the better off we'll be. This is just another example of how we have focused on the U.S. vaccination campaign so strongly, almost perhaps at the expense of of thinking about this as a global pandemic that variants can emerge anywhere and because of the ease of travel can be a threat to the U.S. irrespective of where they emerge. So we have to think about this more as a global pandemic and get effective use of vaccines in these countries that have such low access to vaccines right now. And what about for individuals who are reading the news and are are getting uh, anxious, starting to dream about Omicron? What do you tell them? What can people do to protect themselves? Well, first, be proactive. And the best thing you can do right now is get a booster if you haven't gotten your booster yet. Get your initial vaccination if you haven't gotten your initial vaccination. This virus won't be completely resistant to vaccine-induced immunity because there are lots of regions of the virus that resemble the vaccine strain. So vaccination is still the best way to build population immunity. And we know from viruses like influenza, for instance, that even when the vaccine isn't a perfect match for the circulating virus, the vaccine does provide protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And so go out and get your vaccinations right now because that's the best thing that one can do in terms of helping the population deal with a potential spread of Omicron. So let's talk last question about worst case scenario. We have a pretty severe, highly transmissible virus that does reduce the protection from vaccines. At that point, do you think we're in the world of potentially needing a different kind of booster shot, a booster shot designed around a new variant? Yeah, I think that's something that the vaccine manufacturers have also, I think, come to the realization of. Omicron is different enough from the vaccine that it probably crosses that line to needing some sort of Omicron-specific vaccination. Previous variants that have emerged differed at one or two amino acid changes. And when vaccine manufacturers tested variant-specific vaccines against the original vaccine, they really didn't see a benefit for vaccinating with variant-specific vaccines. I think Omicron has enough mutations that that needs to be readdressed and it needs to be readdressed quickly so that we can bring that on board as a stronger, more effective vaccine if the worst case scenario does come out. So bottom line, there's reason for concern, but we have a whole bunch of scientific tools on our side to protect ourselves. We should take precautions both at a policy level and as individuals, but we shouldn't overreact and we should see the big picture of vaccinating the world. Absolutely. This is not February 2020. We have tools in place. We have immunity in in a significant part of the population. This is a concern. But I think we're in a much better place right now to deal with this and to mitigate this, the extreme effects of this variant than we were at the beginning of the pandemic it, itself. Dr. Pecos, thank you so much for joining me today. Always a pleasure. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. 
Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Thank you.